Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 38. I'm George. And I'm Jim. And I'm Tommy. And I'm Peter. Let's talk about what we're going to have today. Tommy, what do you got for us? Well, you know, uh, I, at the ham fest this year, I bought a D-Star radio. So yeah. I'm going to go over some D-Star basics. Yeah. Uh, not enough time to cover everything, but I'm going to go over some basics. It's a big topic. Yeah. Yeah, Jim, what do you got? Well, I've got a little on audio processing or pre-processing, as you may call it. But, uh, yeah, just how to make your audio sound better when you're on your rig talking phone. Okay, cool. What about you, Peter? I had to solve an interference problem. There's a, a couple of problems that people seem to have over and over with echo link, so I thought I would address those today. Ah, most excellent. Good we've, topic. We've also got a little interview here with our friend Dan, who's got an important announcement for ALTV viewers. And okay. emails back, too, with another Cheap Old Man Minute. Ah, good. Awesome. Well, might as well get it kicked off. Might as well. And by the way, we're going to be giving away this book, Constructing HF Wire Antennas, here a little bit later in the show. Just, you know, save one of those and kind of put that back for me. Well, you know, this is the last one, Jim, and I'm sorry, but you're oh, not eligible. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do with all the emails I sent in? Huh? Uh, I, I deleted them all, man. You're in the spam filter. <laughs> Well, I've got one email here that I really wanted to read this week. It kind of caught me off guard. Go ahead. I got a call the other night from a ham in Memphis uh, named Jim, and uh, he had this to say. And I'd just been thinking about the show. You know, I wonder, you know, what uh, what good comes of it. You know, we we do these for fun, and and we know people are learning a little bit of something, but you never know. Uh, what could be going on and how these shows might be beneficial. Oh, okay. And uh, Jim said, hi, George. I was glad to talk to you the other day on the phone. He said, I'd heard about AmateurLogic.tv from a ham in England. And then he got very ill. He was in the hospital with double pneumonia. His kidney shut down. He had a blood infection, a heart infection, and he was on oxygen. And they, they had told his family that he was going to pass in the night. Whoa. And uh, a nurse there uh, asked him, she said, I know you're a ham and you're into computers. And she lent him a laptop and uh, set it up on his bed there and turned it on. And uh, he said he tuned into Amateur Logic for the first time. And wow. He said, I saw you build things that I used to build. And I said, I'm not going to die. I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> Way to go, Way Jim. Up. Yeah. That's awesome. He said he got up and struggled to put a foot on the floor and started walking more and more every day. And he did get out of the hospital. And now he's back and he says, you saved my life by giving me that old ham spirit. Thanks so much. 7-3, Jim. All right. Awesome. And Jim, we, we really appreciate getting that email. And uh, it's a lot of encouragement to us. And you, you just never know. You know, this stuff is fun to do. And uh, Jim's going to send us some video here in the future of some of his projects. So we're really looking forward Good. to that. Great. Jim, have you got an email there? I do. As a matter of fact, this one is from Mark KF7TKS. And Mark is not only him, but he's a retired elevator constructor. Boy, that'd be an interesting profession, Boy, wouldn't it? It's got its ups and downs. <laughs> yeah, you can go straight to the top at that you, job, man. You've been waiting a long time to use that yeah. one, haven't you? <laughs> well, he says, speaking of ups and downs, that... Uh, He'll probably never have a chance to launch a giant weather balloon and track his progress, but he did see our episodes about that. And he's just wondering what kind of programs that were we were using to track the progress of the balloon. And he's also interested in that other program we were using to decode the CW and the Ridian packet and such. So he wants us to tell what those were, and he suspects that it might have been something like... Uh, What's that program you use to drive your radio? Uh, radio ham, Deluxe. Yeah, Ham Radio Deluxe. Well, I think I did use uh, Digital Master 780 that came with Ham Radio Deluxe for part of that. The one I used the most was a program called FL Digi, and, and it's a great program, too. Uh, and it's and, freely available, isn't yep, it? Yep, both Open of those source? are. Right now, Ham Radio Deluxe, I think, is going to go to a paid model in the future here. And for the packet, 
I use the uh, Kenwood program, the, I can't remember the number of it, ARP 2000 maybe, maybe APR so. 2000, I, I don't remember exactly. Is that but standard Kenwood radio <laughs> software? Yeah, the, the okay, one, the yeah, well, I think it was optional. I, I think you had to buy it separately. But uh, anyway, it's got a little packet terminal in it, and that's what I use for the packet. Okay. By the way, FL Digi is not only open source, but we should also mention its cross-platform runs on Windows, Linux, or Mac. Cool. I've got an email here from Magnus, uh, SM7TVC. He says, uh, thank you for a great show, always interesting in a relaxing way. My favorite episode is number 31, Field Day, great job. Episode 18, Factory Tour on Ameritron was also uh, very interesting. Keep up the good work. Always look forward to your next episode. Yep, uh, thanks, uh, Magnus. Uh, we enjoy making them. We really appreciate hearing from our viewers around the world of the program. We know that there's a lot of them out there, but looking at our stats and all, uh, there's, there's people all over the world that you know are hams and into this kind of thing. This is our own little community. Guys, I want you to meet my buddy, Dan Van Evenhoven. Oh, hey, Dan. Dan. Good evening. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Dan's call is N9LVS. You may recognize that. I do recognize I that. Now, yeah. where do I recognize that from? Uh, Dan does the wiki over at Ham Nation for us. And ah, that's been yes. a big help. Yes, yeah. Now I, I, I yeah. yeah. When did you start doing that, Dan? About episode three. I started doing that and been doing it ever since. Yeah, we really appreciate it. It's a big help since Twit doesn't do their own wikis. They rely on viewers to do it. So, uh... We really appreciate you taking the reins and running with that. And I believe you got a special announcement for us, don't you? Yes, I do. I'm starting to do the wiki for your show. Yeah. Oh, man. That's yeah. That's great. It's already up there and running, too. Yep. I uh, backdated all the way to show 20. Yeah. I oh. took a look at it earlier today. It looks great. It does. Good deal. Thank you, Dan. Not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, basically, anybody can put stuff on the wiki. Uh, in fact, I encourage it. Um, uh, I kind of put up a template there, a uh, rough outline. Basically what I do is I go through the show twice, write down my notes on the show, and then put those into the wiki. And uh, anybody can add to that uh, or make some corrections because uh, I do make mistakes occasionally, and and uh, uh, anybody's welcome to, do, to help on the one for uh, Amateur Logic or the one for Ham Nation. Well... You know, if you if you go through the shows twice, I bet you find more than just a few errors of our own that that we make. <laughs> now, now I wasn't going to say that, but uh... <laughs> a lot of them fly by that first time so fast that the mm -hmm. casual viewer won't pick up on it. But yeah, yeah, I I think we all make errors, and and you just keep going with the flow. Just let it go. <laughs> Tell, tell us what's on your shirt. Well, this is my, my Survive Dayton shirt. I've got one of these for every year I've been to Dayton. Uh, this coming up one, I just looked uh, today, and this coming uh, Dayton Hamvention will be my 22nd uh, year going to Dayton Hamvention. So wow. Uh, I am there pretty much every year. Yeah, well, you answered my next question. I was wondering if you were going to be there. George and I are going to make it, so maybe we'll yeah. meet you in person. So then, oh, yeah. Yeah. How far away are you from from Dayton? Where are you now, or, or and are you at home? Uh, right now, I'm at my office, uh, and uh, I'm about 20 miles southwest of Green Bay, Wisconsin. And that's where you uh, in that area is where you live. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So for for me, it's a it's a easy eight hour drive, nine hour drive. It depend depending on how much pedal I want to put in there. <laughs> well, what's the temperature like there today? Actually, today it's 63 degrees. We're wearing short, short sleeve shirts today. Wow. Yeah, it's 80 mm. here. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some might prefer the, uh, the to be here rather than uh, there, but uh, uh, that situation will reverse before long. Well, the, the, this is known as the frozen tundra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't have much ice fishing up there this year, did they? Kind of warm no, water. there wasn't a whole lot of ice fishing going on this year. Uh, Lake Winnebago, which is a uh, lake where I live just off of, uh, never really froze over. Usually we can drive our cars on that lake uh, uh, by uh, mid-December, 
but uh, I never uh, took that treachery with my uh, Jeep uh, this year. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, oh. tell them where we first met. We first met on Google Plus uh, Hangout. Uh, we do a nightly hangout there uh, just about every night on um, on Google+. Plus uh, Starts about 9, 10 o'clock Central Time and has been known to go to 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Usually it gets over about midnight, uh, midnight 1 o'clock. Um, but we talk about all kinds of uh, things, uh, uh, mostly ham radio related. We've gotten several people that have got uh, their feet wet on D-Star and that and um, there's, uh, Tom Samasico's in there every night. My other time uh, friend. If you, yeah. if you, um, uh, check on either one of us on, on Google Plus and just let us know that you want to be added to the, to the hangout, we'll add you in. Well, that's great. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our viewers before we go, Dan? Ah, I think we pretty much covered it. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. Now, don't you have some position with the ARRL there in Wisconsin? Yeah, I'm the affiliate club coordinator for the ARRL for the state of Wisconsin. Um, it's a position that I've had for several years now. That's a lot of fun. Uh, I get to hang out with uh, uh, different clubs, and uh, a lot of times I'll Skype into the to the clubs rather than making the trek across the state uh, to uh, talk to either um, board directors or a lot of times it's the board of directors, but uh, sometimes I actually show up at club meetings via Skype. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was great to talk with you, Dan. Thank you for all that you do for Amateur Radio and for Ham Nation and now for Amateur Logic as well. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Yeah. I mean, Dan. <laughs> my my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, Dan is up there in cheese country, isn't he? I tell you, man, I bet he's got a cheese head around there somewhere. Uh, I love <laughs> cheese. <laughs> I would love to go and uh, visit Dan, as in fact, yeah. I will say he did a fine job on the wiki. It he looks, it looks awesome. Job. Really awesome. Thanks, Dan, again. And the address, by the way, is uh, www.wiki, that's W-I-K-I, dot amateurlogic.tv. And we'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> or Dan will. <laughs> well, I've got an email here. It says, uh, hi, guys. Hello from Manuel's Newfoundland. Love the shows. Great job as always. I really don't have any complaints about the show. You seem to have a nice variety of content that all can enjoy. Perhaps a segment on how to obtain your amateur radio license. It's always good to get new people into the hobby. And uh, most definitely that's a, a good suggestion. This comes from our friend Scott, V-O-1-A-D-N. Cool. And uh, that is a great suggestion, Scott. Yeah. yeah. I love I love hearing from people all over it's kind of like getting a qsl card you know when you get yeah. an email from somebody way off or even close by yeah and they've got the same interest you do yeah you know it's like i say it's one one big community ham radio has already had that you know has always been yeah. that way way before the internet and, came and around we're just able to connect through more avenues now than we yeah. I, I love getting the suggestions from the viewers yeah because yeah. uh, it's it's important to me to to they're fun to to, yeah. to build or whatever we do for them, and, and it's nice to know that somebody actually wants to well, see what you're putting together. Interact. It, it's your show, you know, and and your input really uh, has a lot to do with what we have on Amateur Logic. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I've got a couple of pet peeves about Echo Link. Ah. Let's take a look at that. I thought it might be a good time to discuss a couple of problems that people seem to keep having with Echo Link connecting or if you do connect you time out and audio levels those just seem to keep coming up so let's go over that and see what can be done let's talk about audio devices first we'll click on tools and then adjust sound devices and playback and that'll bring up the windows volume control that lets us see the playback level of the sound card there may be several volume sliders there but we only need the wave and the volume sliders if there's a line in, we click mute on that because we don't want to feed the line in back out through our speakers. Now, if you're just plugging in a microphone and using Echo Link with the computer alone, then this setting is not going to be that critical. It would mostly just adjust the volume you want to hear out of your speakers or headphones. However, if you're connecting a radio with the computer to use Echo Link, then these settings become critical. In that case, the playback levels are adjusting the mic level that's feeding the radio. 
And you need to be careful. You want the VU to show right about here where it's just barely beginning to show yellow. You don't want it too low, and you certainly don't want it slapping the end of the scale either. Next, we want to check what Windows calls the record level, so we click on Options and Properties, and then we click the Recording button, and it shows a list down there in the bottom of the window of the different inputs that you can have for your sound card. Now, if you've got line in, that's definitely what you want to use. Do not use microphone there unless that's all you've got. You'll come out of the speaker jack on the radio and feed the line in of your sound card. When we were adjusting the playback controls earlier, that was actually adjusting the modulation input of the radio that we had connected. It picks up the audio that's coming from another echo link station over the internet and adjusts the level feeding the radio. Now, for the recording control, we're doing right the opposite. We're adjusting the level that's coming over the air from the speaker out of the radio and feeding back into the computer, and that adjusts the level that the people listening on another echo link node will hear. We want to adjust it the same, being careful that we just get into the yellow, don't have it too high or too low. Now, in many cases, you'll be able to get away with just running simple patch cords between the radio and the computer. However, in some cases, you might have problems with hum or RFI or level matching. In that case, you'll need a little interface to go with the rig. And if you look back at episode 7 of AmateurLogic.tv, we introduced Echolink in that show and also showed how you could build a small audio interface to use between a rig and a computer. That's enough about audio, so let's talk about the internet side of Echolink now. We'll want to go to the Windows Start button and access the control panel. We'll choose Network Connections and we'll locate our LAN card which is, in this case, Local Area Connection 3. We'll right-click that and then choose Properties. Now what we're going to need to do is configure a static IP address for this computer. By default, Windows sets up all of its connections as dynamic hosts, so your router is assigning an IP address. That's not going to work here because the router is going to be responsible for routing the information coming in on certain ports from the Internet to this particular computer. And the only way it's going to know to locate this computer is by its IP address. So we'll choose Internet Protocol, TCP IP, and then we'll choose Properties. And now here you can see that I have already entered an IP address for this computer. Normally Windows would have it set to obtain an IP address automatically, but we need it set to use the following IP address. In this case, I have assigned 192.168.0.112 as the IP address for my Echolink computer. Now the subnet mask is 255.255.255.0 in most cases. And the default gateway on my machine here and my network is 192.168.0.1. I also use the preferred DNS server with the same number. Now this could be different depending on who you're using for an internet service provider. A lot of DSL folks will find the default gateway and preferred DNS settings are different than the address of your router. That's a little beyond the scope of what I can cover here since there's so many different possible combinations. The main thing I wanted to point out was you need a static IP address so that Echolink will work properly. Now let's bring up Internet Explorer just to make sure that our internet connection is working. And it appears that it is. Now let's go to Echolink. We'll choose Tools and Setup. Then we'll choose Proxy. And we'll note that by default Echolink is set to Direct Connect, no Proxy. That's where you want it, if at all possible. And there's another setting down here, Use Specific Proxy, but that's not the preferred way. We will talk about it later, though. Now, the next thing we need to do is go into the setup screen of our router. On my particular D-Link router here, I use Internet Explorer, and I go to 192.168.0.1. And that brings up my router's setup page. I'll go to the Advanced tab, and then I need to set some port forwarding rules. If you look, you'll notice that I've set up two different port forwarding rules here. Both of them have the IP address of my Echolink computer that I entered earlier. 
That's 192.168.0.112. On the top port forwarding rule, I set that one up for a traffic type of UDP, and I set a start range of 5198 and an end range of 5199. On the second port forwarding rule, I use the same IP address. This one I set the traffic type to TCP and the address to 5200. Echolink requires these exact ports to work properly. If you don't have them set right, then you'll get that dreaded timeout error. If you do have your computer, Echolink, and your router set up for proper port forwarding, and you still can't connect, or you still get timeout errors, then it's possible that the firewall on your computer, or your antivirus or anti-malware program, could be blocking the ports. You could try setting an exception for Echolink in these programs, and that might possibly work. To determine if one of them is at fault, though, you might try temporarily disabling it and see if that helps. There could be times when it's just not possible to set a port forwarding rule in a router, like in the case when you're visiting a friend or you're at a hotel. Fortunately, there is a workaround for this. Go to Tools, and then choose Setup, and choose Proxy. As I mentioned earlier, by default, Echolink prefers that you use direct connection, no proxy. But we're going to choose Public Proxy. We'll click Refresh List to get a listing of the currently available proxies on the Internet. A proxy is simply a server that someone's graciously provided that can do the port forwarding for you, and it'll send you the Echolink data over a typical port that's normally open on your computer. The reason that you wouldn't normally want to do this is because of latency and the fact that these proxies come and go. So each time you connect to Echolink, you might have to find a different proxy. I'll choose a proxy from the list that looks like it's somewhere near my location, at least the same country when possible. Then click OK. And it says Proxy Connected, Fetching Data, and it looks like we're connected to Echolink. So this is one way to get around the problems of port forwarding, but as I said earlier, only when you have to. Now, we've looked at Windows XP today, and the reason I did that is because my Echolink machine <laughs> runs Windows XP. The settings on Windows 7 and other operating systems will be a little different. Basically, you need to do the same thing no matter which operating system you're running. I hope these tips have helped a little bit, and we won't be hearing distorted audio or timeout quite as often in the future. Good luck and happy echo linking. Yeah, I know what you mean about the echo link things, man. That's uh, the the constant connect and disconnects. That can be a little bit uh, annoying, I guess, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah, well, you know, I hope this sheds a little bit of light on it. I really should have had one of you networking guys talk about this. You know, I'm not. Oh no. Not really a networking guy, but, uh, you know, this is what worked for me, so maybe somebody will get some use out of it. I'm sure so. they will. Yeah. I've, you can uh, actually practice it on the uh, Equilink net on the 16th. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be having the next uh, Amateur Logic uh, Echolink and D-Star nets on the 16th this month. Uh, tune in to our Facebook page. And also check the website, and we'll have the exact times those nets will start. And uh, we'll post it on the Twitter account as well. Yeah, unfortunately, I won't be there this time. I'll, I'll be in Vegas at the NAB show. So uh, these two guys here are going to handle it this time. And maybe we'll have Peter check in again. No problem. Yeah. Will we be... If I'm available. Will we be... Which is daytime. Sorry, sorry, Jimmy. It's daytime when, I, uh, uh, when it's on, so unfortunately I can't always make it. I understand. It's understandable. Well, will we be announcing the winner of the HF wire antenna book at that time, or is no, that? No, we'll be announcing it here in a few minutes. Ah, well, in that case, let me read this next email. Okay. It is from our friend Rory in six O I L. Uh, that that could make something Oil. out of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I could make something out of that. Anyway, Rory says. Hey, I would like to put my entry in for the wire antenna book since I live on a two and a half acre parcel. Yeah, he's got the room for it. And uh, he wants to put up a 160 meter off center fed dipole on that two and a half oh, acres. 
He says he really loves the show and he's always sharing it with the new hams that he has there at their school. They got licensed for disaster preparedness and CERT. And he says he really learns a lot from us as his Elmers. And he also says that his 10-year-old son watches the show and now he's ready to get into the ham radio family because of it. And he really gets a kick out of the things that Peter brings to the show. And he also says he would really like to go to VK land. And I second that. So <laughs> yeah. he says that's just a few reasons why he finds the show really entertaining and, uh, and likes to watch. Well, thanks, Rory. We appreciate yeah. that. Maybe we'll have to have a Amateur Logic VK cruise one day. And, you know, we'll just all load up in the fishing boat and head Chuck down there. Over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get ready, Peter. I've got an email here. Uh, hello, George, Jim, Tommy, and Peter. Uh, thanks for all the episodes you released until now. You asked what the viewers like at Amateur Logic. For me, there are a lot of reasons to watch Amateur Logic. Uh, it's entertaining, it's educational, it's inspiring, and it helps me improve my English. Uh, that's four reasons, and I'm sure there are a lot more. Uh, 73 is from Wolf DC 9 fo and I suspect that uh, D the DC-9 would be Germany. Well, thanks, Wolfgang. Uh, it's really nice to get positive feedback like that. Uh, one thing that really surprises me is the, the benefit that people actually uh, get out of watching Amateur Logic. And in particular, uh, what, what I, I ne never see seems to amaze me is the number of people that, uh, or new people, that are actually getting involved in the hobby as a result of watching Amateur Logic. Very true, Peter. Very true. Yeah. I noticed he said it, it helps with his English, but, you know, reading his email here, you know, he's got better English than I do already, so <laughs> yes. it must really be working. <laughs> he don't got no problem. He, he don't got no problem. No, yeah. got no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, what have you got this week? I know you told us earlier, but give us a little introduction. Well, I got to thinking about audio a lot, and uh, as you know, I've had some audio issues. And so um, I just thought we'd take a look at audio, everything in the chain from when you're speaking, where does it begin, where does the audio go when it leaves your mouth, and where does it end up, and what all does it go through between there and your rig. Hello again, amateurs. What I'd like to talk to you about today is near and dear to the hearts of many operators, but yet to others, not so much. I'm talking about audio, specifically the audio that's destined for phone mode on your rig. While many amateurs are content to simply buy a microphone at a ham fest and plug it in and go, other operators will spend upwards of $10,000 on making their rig sound better. No matter which camp you fall into, what we're going to talk about today can help both groups maximize their audio sound and make it better. Now first, a small disclaimer. While the list of gadgets that can be purchased and plugged in to make your rig sound better are almost innumerable, I'm only going to cover the ones I use. Also, I am specifically talking about pre-processing your audio. That is to say, how to make the audio sound better before it gets into your rig. I'm not going to discuss what to do to your audio once it gets into the rig. And with that, let us begin with tip number one, which is how to set up your microphone and what kind of microphone you might use. While most microphones are very sensitive and can pick up your voice from a long way away, it's much better to have your microphone situated much closer to its source. Why is this a good idea? It allows you to turn down the microphone's gain, thereby reducing noise from the surrounding environment, like that noisy computer, the neighbor's dogs, or dare we say it, the XYL. Also, physically isolating your mic from contact, like I have here with a mic boom homebrewed from an office lamp, will aid in reducing noise pickup. This microphone is a Studio Projects B1, which I bought new back in the day for about $100. I think the current model is called the B3 for about the same price. And now, tip number two, our second stop along my audio chain, is a mic preamp. 
Here I'm using a Behringer mixer on air, but as another example, this is an Arts Studio V3, which I use as a part of my portable recording studio and is actually processing the audio on my lavalier microphone for this podcast. The Studio V3 features a 12AX7 tube, if memory serves, and that helps warm the audio up a bit. That's one function of the mic preamp, to color or shape the audio to the way you'd like it to be. Another feature is they can provide phantom power, which is something condenser-style mics like the Studio B1 needs. And tip number three, and our next stop, is the major processing stop in the chain. This next piece of gear can vary widely as to what it is, but again, its major function is to do more coloring and shaping of the audio. Here, I use an Aphex Oral Exciter. This piece of gear was popular in Los Angeles and some Nashville recording studios in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. While originally costing in the tens of thousands, I was able to pick this one up off eBay for about 100 bucks. Many ham enthusiasts run a parameter EQ or effects processor or compressor or limiter or some combinations thereof at this point in the audio chain. Tip number four, use an audio isolator. In the ham business, RF gets into everything, including all the equipment we just discussed. So it's a good practice to run your audio pre-processing chain through an audio isolator just before you route the audio to your rig. For more information about audio isolators, see episode 34 where I show how I homebrewed this one. Total cost was less than 30 bucks. And on to tip number five. This is about audio routing. Using wiring and switching, you can route your audio to where you'd like it to go. For example, here, at the next stop in my audio chain, I have a homebrewed microphone push-to-talk switch into which I've built an audio routing switch. At this point, I can send the audio that began at my microphone on into the rig or to my computer for doing things like recording this podcast. Total cost was, again, less than $30. So in summary, there you are, five tips and techniques you can use to make your audio sound like you spent a lot of money on it and you have a lot of audio pre-processing equipment. Hope you enjoyed it. Maybe next time we'll talk about how to make your audio sound better once it gets inside the rig. Well, Jim, that was great. You know, we just can't get enough audio. And I, I really want to know, where can I find one of those perimeter EQs? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things. When you're shooting and you're recording that, kind of stuff you just I don't know your mind goes out the window sometimes uh, because I've been calling parametric EQs parametric EQs all my life except for that one, one moment time. yeah <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean and I, it was pretty good how when you talk about how when the mouth, audio leaves your mouth where it's going to go I usually most time I'm concerned whether who's going to hear it and if it's going to get me in trouble <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you built an audio interface a while back just for that purpose, but when you got through and we were testing it on the air, you still had some yep. some RF problems and such. What did you come it's, up with? It's just the little things that get you. And I'm I'm glad you're bringing this up now because I've got a piece of video that we want to roll while we're talking about this and because I just made reference to it in that last segment. And it was a couple of wiring. Well, it was one wiring error in the pot and uh, and George was kind enough to uh, get this little piece of video right here tell him George what this is well as you can see originally the pot was in this direction it actually needs to be turned counterclockwise about 90 degrees and connected in this fashion to work right before the way it was it would actually change the level when you turned it up and down, but uh, you were actually the wrong resistance. yeah you were shorting out the transformer, and that's the reason that it reduced yeah. the level. And that one, being dumb enough on its own, this uh, I mean I should have caught that one, but this next one could slip by anyone. Yeah, it has to do with the mounting of the quarter-inch uh, phone jacks. 
don't forget to use an isolating washer. In other words, both the phone jacks are mounted to the chassis. So, what do you got? A ground loop. A ground loop. <laughs> <laughs> and what you, uh, what you don't want, that's exactly what you don't want to do. So, buy you some nylon washers or, or whatever kind of washers you use. Yeah, or a rubber grommet, anything yeah. you can isolate it so that that ring on that connector doesn't touch the metal case. Exactly. Well, I've got an email. It says, howdy gents. I have to say I'm a newer ham. I've had my general ticket since January of 2011, and your shows are very informative. I enjoy them quite a bit. I'm a wire antenna enthusiast. My blog, k7pwt.blogspot.com, contains several posts on wire antennas, uh, but some homebrew 40-meter Carolina Wyndham has by far the most hits and emails. I can believe that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a very popular antenna. I'll have to go check his blog out, though, because I'm definitely a wire antenna enthusiast. Yeah, no doubt. Um, anyway, he says, uh, please keep up the good work. Thank you for dedicating your time and effort back into this great hobby. As to what I like best about your program is that you guys are real hams talking about real stuff. I would not change a thing. That's from our friend Kelly, K7PWT. Thanks for the kind words, Kelly, and I'm going to go check out your, your blog as well. Yeah. Now, I've got an email here from Wayne, K4WK, and Wayne says, I really enjoy the segments when George and Jim are bannering. You all really work good together. And uh, Wayne, uh, I'm <laughs> insulted by that. Uh, Jim and I don't even know what bannering means. How can we be doing it? <laughs> no, thanks, Wayne. <laughs> yeah, He'll get his feel this segment, won't he? Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, here's Emil with another Cheap Old Man Minute. Welcome to another episode of Cheap Old Man Minutes. While talking to Sam, KT4QW, on 17 meters, he was telling me about a loop antenna that he wrote an article for in QST. So, sure enough, I found that article and uh, built that antenna, I scaled my version for 10 and 20 meters, so it's bigger for 20 meters than the one written in the article, but it gives you the formulas to uh, be able to scale it for yourself. It, the antenna is well worth the uh, effort. It did not cost that much, maybe $25. And the signal to noise ratio on, on the loop, at least in my case, is better than my wire that's hanging up uh, in the trees. So from KE5QKR, and uh, I'll say thanks to KT4QW Sam for a recommendation on a great antenna. You never know what email is going to be into each time, and there's one thing you, you can be pretty sure of, though. It's going to be cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. It's that's right what I like alley. to see. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks, Emil. All right, I've got an email here. Uh, I always look forward to the next release of Amateur Logic. Uh, you guys are always providing information and insight into furthering the hobby. Keep up the good work. 73 from Craig KC7CUE. Uh, thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, we enjoy making uh, the shows and uh, hopefully we'll be making them for a while yet. I should say one thing is that we're going to try and uh, keep to a more regular schedule now and hopefully we'll be uh, able to put out a new episode uh, every, uh, every month by uh, the 15th of the month. Right, Peter. Very true. Yeah. That's, uh, I'm glad we did that, too. Um, I've got an email. It says, um, Hi, guys. Please enter me in the contest to win the HF Wire Antenna book. I guess I got some competition there. I really enjoy the show because you guys, 
<laughs> you guys go into so many different parts of amateur radio building, experimenting, operating, different modes, etc. Thanks so much for producing the show. I look forward to every episode. Plus, you don't just run out and buy everything you need for your shacks. I'm way too low budget for that. Thanks again. That's from Byron N4 T I Z, and we're way too low budget for that too. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're right there with you, Byron. And watch what happens when I transmit lines all across the screen. This is not good. What it means is that interference, or rather RF, I should say, is actually coming in and uh, interfering with my uh, computer and monitor, etc. So. Anyway, I contacted George about this, and he suggested two things that might uh, possibly solve this problem of stray RF. The first is a better ground system, and that's something that I'll certainly look at doing in the near future. But the other solution is this. This is an ugly balen, and it's very, very easy to make. You've got between 18 and 21 foot of coax, wrapped around in a coil and then that's just coming out to a couple of connectors here which is what I'm going to connect my wire dipole to and here the other end I've just connected to a coax connector and that's going to connect to the cable that runs down to my transceiver very very simple to make as I said 18 to 21 foot of coax just wrapped around in a coil like that and uh, that goes between your antenna and your transceiver. So we're going to uh, go and install this and let's see if it works. Well, we're back. My ugly balen has been installed and it's time to give it a, a road test. Same deal again. Uh, we're on, it, on 40 meters again. Ooh, a few static crashes around tonight. Uh, this is Victor Kilo 3 Papa Bravo testing. And again, full carrier on ready. And we'll start off with the transmission. Now, as you can see, it's a significant reduction in the in interference. Uh, not perfect, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm going full carrier here, so uh, ordinarily I wouldn't be putting out that much power. So that's, uh, that's quite a good result. So Peter, were you happy with uh, how well your air ballon or your ugly ballon worked? Yeah, I'm really happy there, Jimmy. And uh, I suspect my neighbors may be uh, a bit happier as well because the chances are that uh, if you're causing that kind of interference to your computer or to your monitor, you, you could well be causing interference to your neighbors as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, sure sir, can. indeed. And you know, I used it here myself, and, and it helped us. Well, I think you've used it, Tommy, yeah, and I'm, I think Jim's I'm used sure. it. I'm sure. I've actually got the material sitting yeah. there to make another yeah. one. Yeah. George, in fact, he used to open up all the garage doors simultaneously yeah. and close them yeah. right yeah. here in this neighborhood where he lives before yeah. he put his on. And my neighbors don't even have electric doors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got an email here from Bill, KE4WKP. He says, hi, George, Jim, Tommy, and Peter. I like everything about the show, but I'm especially liking the building aspect. I, I like to build things, and that's what amateur radio is all about. He likes the from the bench segments, and he really enjoyed the soft rock build. And he'd like to see more on software defined radio. Uh, he liked my IF mod for the TS2000, and he was asking when can we expect to see more about that. Soon, Bill. I'm not sure <laughs> of an exact date, but, but soon. Oh, that's a bit of a button with George. He's been promising to get to that one for a while. Now. I have, and uh, it's, you know, it's going to take a uh, while to do. And boy, I've been doing so much video here yes, the indeed. past six yeah. months yeah. that uh, Very I'm busy. getting to Very it. Very busy. Uh, Tommy, you did something special this time around, didn't you? Well, I, I had a little delve into D-Star, <clears throat> and uh, I went through, well, You've been de-starting it up, boy, yeah, I tell I, you. I've yeah. been having a ball with it. Let me, yeah. show, let me show you what I found out. If some of you follow the Facebook group and Twitter accounts, you see that uh, I'm kind of new to D-Star. I picked up a, a D-Star Handy Talkie at the Jackson Ham Fest, and 
I've been really enjoying it. We have several nets around here that I wanted to participate on them, so I decided to take the plunge. Like a lot of you, uh, I've kind of resisted it because I was under the impression that, you know, totally closed system. But I really wanted to try it. Uh, there are a lot of capabilities there that, that would work well for me with uh, travel, with my regular work and everything. And uh, I tell you what, I have really, really enjoyed it. So anyway, uh, it, it is somewhat closed as far as the details of the codec, but as far as I, I know, I believe you can buy the, uh, the chip and the board pretty inexpensive. I think it's 10 to $25, um, you know, if someone wanted to build their own hardware. So, I mean, that part, yeah, maybe it is, but the rest of it, I think, is pretty widely published. Nevertheless, <clears throat> if it is or isn't, you know, that, I don't want to get into that. It's really been a lot of fun. Um, as we've mentioned before on the show, I travel a lot with my job, and um, I wanted to be able to communicate back to my friends and check in on the, uh, the nets while I'm away, things like that, and... You know, it doesn't matter where you are. It's very similar to Echo Link, which is which is great. I use it a, a lot as well. It's just a little different. So there are a lot of ups, you know, to it. Uh, if you have good bandwidth, good connection, the audio quality is it's pretty good. You're either pretty much in there, or you're not. And uh, when you're kind of on the fringe, I think they call it R2D2, and, and that's exactly what it sounds like. R2D2 off the Star Wars movies. Um, you know there are a lot of capabilities you can send data along with it you know if you have a gps hooked up to your rig you can send your coordinates and the d-star system can pass it on through to aprs so you show up on the aprs maps uh, aprs.fi whichever one you use you can send messages they've got a system called uh, drats which is a data system uh, text messaging type thing that uses the D-Star system and I'm just breaking the surface of that and we may do another segment on that part in the future once I get it kind of figured out. Probably the biggest downside that I see is lack of repeaters and there there are a lot of them that are popping up you know all the time. You go to some of the D-Star sites I think D-Star info shows the newest ones. There's some equipment you can get to get around that problem. You can either get one of those an inexpensive board and build your own hotspot, or you can do like I did and get this uh, DV access point, which is a little two meter, well, essentially, it's basically a two, two meter D-star repeater that only operates at like 10 milliwatts. Great for around the house. So I can uh, plug this thing up to my computer and use my laptop, I'm sorry, my use my handy talkie to, to connect to any of the reflectors the repeaters or whatever I want to do with it. The only thing so far that I found is a limitation is um, call sign routing doesn't work. What is call sign routing? That's when you put in the call sign, which I'll show you in a few moments. And no matter where you are, if that person has been on the on a repeater on the D Star system recently, then it will route your transmission to wherever they were at the last time and they should hear you on the air. So it's pretty neat stuff. That's uh, one thing that Echo Link does not have. And we'll go over the uh, access point in a future segment. It's really cool stuff. The other thing that's kind of a little bit of a downside of it, at least until you get used to it, is it's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, it's a little daunting because you've got four places essentially when you're going to talk to someone that you have that you can put some data and there's a specific format of the string that you put in the radio to to tell the repeater or the reflector or whatever what you want to do so if you want to connect to a repeater well first of all you you put your call sign in the radio so it always knows it's you the radio actually ids for you uh digitally if you key up, other people will see on the bottom of the radio your call sign and a message that you that you put on there. The next thing you would do is put in the call sign of who you want to talk to. Most of the time it's CQ three times, so it would be CQ, CQ, CQ. Then there's an RPT1 and an RPT2. 
RPT1 would be the repeater or the reflector that you're going to connect to or that you're going to use to talk on. The RPT2 would be, most of the time I put the, the repeater and a G for the gateway so that my transmissions are routed out you know, through the internet to, to wherever others may be. So if people are connected in with a, uh, a DV access point or a DV dongle or another LinkedIn repeater, I believe that's required for your, data, for your uh, transmissions to go through and they can hear them as well. Let's do a quick demonstration. I'm going to take my handy talkie and because I'm kind of in uh, fringe areas of the repeater, I'm going to use my DV access point. But it'll work pretty much the same as you going straight to the repeater. And let's link to the repeater so we can make a call. My radio is dual watch, but I'm turning off the other side. This is the frequency I've got set up on my DV access point. So let's go into the menus, go into the call sign menu. And you can see I've got, I guess you can see, your call says CQ, 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 which is everyone. And I want to change that. So I'm going to push the enter, scroll around, and find the call sign of my local repeater, which is K5RKN. I've got B, which is port B. It's a 440 side of the repeater. And I've got L, which means I want to link to it. Those are critical to be in the seventh and eighth position of the data. If you don't put it there, it won't work. So let's save that. Go back out of here. Tap the remote system linked. So we're linked to the repeater. Now, if I hit the enter again, that's really shaky. If I hit enter again, it's going to try to send that link command. So what we want to do is go back into the menu, go back into the call sign, change it to CQ, and anyone that's in the repeater that we're linked to now can hear us. If you see, I don't have anything in R1 and R2 any, right now. If I were connected directly to the repeater, I would have the call sign of the repeater in R1 and the call sign of the repeater with a G for gateway in the last position for R2. So my traffic would go out over the gateway if anyone were linked in. Okay, so let's go back out of here and let's see if anyone's on. W5JDX and 5ZNO. And 5ZNO, this is W5JDX. I see you're on the DVAP this afternoon, Tommy. Yeah, Roger. I'm uh, doing a little demonstration for the Amateur Logic viewers to uh, kind of show them how D-Star works. How does it sound? Man, it sounds great. The uh, audio quality on, on D-Star typically just sounds pretty good. It's uh, nice and clean, no static, but uh, you do have a little bit of a digitized sound in it, but uh, it, overall it's not bad. Yeah, a little different sound. Um, some people sound uh, like other people on here, just I guess because of the way that the algorithms handle it. But usually everyone's uh, very understandable, clean, and like you say, never any noise in there with it. Okay, well, you have a good afternoon there, and we'll be looking forward to seeing this video. Tell you five JDX. All right, I'll talk to you a little bit later on. Appreciate the QSO. And 5 z and O. Hey, you can see it sounds pretty good. Um, he's not very far from me, but I'm actually using my DV access point sitting over here on the table and like I said we'll cover that in a future segment. I'm going to go ahead and disconnect from the uh, the repeater. I'm going to use the same thing we did except I'm going to change the L to a U for unconnect or unlink. Unconnect. Is that a word? Okay let's unlink it. Menu. Call sign. You can see we've we need to change this to 
the repeater call sign with an U at the end for unlink and menu and one tap of the push to talk remote system unlinked and we're disconnected there's a lot of options we didn't go through them uh, didn't go through all of them you can do some reading up on it but the the basics essentially are what we just showed you you put in the the call sign of the repeater and CQ 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 and if you're in range you can hit the push to talk it's going to get broadcast out to everyone that can hear it over the air now if people are linked in you need to put the repeater with a G so it'll be trunked out through the internet and come out wherever they're linked from so they can hear you as well um, I hope you enjoyed it and I'm still learning about it I've had it since uh, Hamfest at the end of January <clears throat> and I've used it quite a bit while I've traveled with my job um, but I almost always use the the DV access point and we, we may go over that on the next segment maybe next month um, sometime in the very near future anyway I hope you enjoyed it and if I can answer any questions as always send me an email catch me at amateur logic on Twitter or um, on the Amateur Logic Facebook group. Check that uh, really frequently. Well, Tommy, I know you were hem hawing a lot about buying that D Star radio at the Ham Fest. How do you <laughs> feel about it now? Yeah, man, I'll tell you what, I, I have really, really enjoyed it. it You've it's been so on much it. fun. Oh, yeah, I've been burning it up. Yeah. I bought, since then, I bought the GPS mic, I bought a DV access point. <laughs> I'm thinking about buying the IC31 handy talkie and a D Star rig for my truck. You can just give me your 92 after you, know, I still you get the 31. Need it too, man. I got to have one for each hand. <laughs> yeah. I've been enjoying this ID880 back here yeah. too, man. It, it is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I may get one of those for my truck. But anyway, uh, I want to mention about my segment. <clears throat> you can only get so much in 10 minutes. And I ran, actually ran over, but I didn't get to cover reflectors there's a lot of things to cover so there's going to be some more d star segments coming cool in the near future there you go well listen i've got one more email before okay. we get away and it's an important one all right it's from curtis ae4 se and he has a one-line email that says he'd just like to say he likes the email portion of the show best covers lots of topics quickly well, Curtis, I'm glad uh, you're going to enjoy this episode because <laughs> we've had a lot of emails and, and virtually all of these emails, with the exception of one, came from that contest that we announced in the last episode. And we had asked people to uh, send us in an email to contest at amateurlogic.tv. And we got a good many responses out of there. And that's where all of these emails, except the first one I read uh, from Jim up in Memphis, that's where they all came from. And Jim, you read the email from the winning entry earlier. I did? Yep. It was uh, Mark Brink, KF7TKS. Yeah. Mark, congratulations. You won the Constructing HF Wire Antennas book from Jerry Buston, KR7KZ. Well, uh, doggone it, Mark. You beat me out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try to get this mailed out to you before Tommy has a chance to grab it. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a, uh, a couple other things that we needed to mention here. And one is our net. And when is that, Jim? Monday, April 16th. And I think that kicks off at, I want to give it in UTC time, but I'm just not going to be able to pull that out of my hat. So I'll have to say, Tommy, <laughs> what time does it start? 8.30 Central Time. Yeah, well. On the Echo. Uh, 8 o'clock for D-Star, 8.30 Central, I think. Right I, I tell you what, better yet, Look check. at our Facebook yes. page. We don't know. We'll <laughs> be there <laughs> when we get there. Yeah. Oh. Check the AmateurLogic.tv <laughs> Facebook page and also check the AmateurLogic.tv website. That's and right. we'll have an announcement <laughs> as to the correct times for the net since none of us seem to know, but we, somebody awful, will be dude. there. That's our net. Yeah. It's staggered. It's, yeah. it, time, the times are staggered. So On Echo Link, it's going to be on the Do Drop In conference server, which is star, Do Drop In, star, D-O-D-R-O-P-I-N. That's how you spell it. And it's node number 355-800. And Tommy, where can they find the, the D-Star net? 
Reflector 14, Module C. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, also, we ask you uh, in the last episode to go fill out our survey so that we can learn more about who's watching the show and, and what kind of things you like. We learned a lot. We have learned a lot, and I almost was ready to reveal it today. But I think we need to go one more, one more round. round. Okay. Yeah. So anyone that hasn't filled out the survey yet, if you just go to the Amateur Logic website, uh, you'll find a uh, link on there where you can take the quick survey. It only should take you a couple of minutes, and all the answers are confidential in it. And it'll help us understand better who's watching the show. Uh, also, uh, the wiki is brand new, and it's up now. Yep. We talked with Dan earlier, and here's the link for the wiki right here. And Anything else we need to mention, George? Well, I've got a couple of trips coming up here. I'm going to be at NAB, not oh. uh, this coming week, but the next week. And I hope to bring back a little footage from there. We'll be shooting an episode of Ham Nation while I'm there. And we'll also be uh, streaming live on Twit during the uh, Ham Radio reception that Hile Sound does out there wow. for all the hams every year. Oh, okay. Thanks, Bon. I hate, yeah. to, I hate I'm going to miss it this year. Yeah, you, you really yeah. should have. Could have just come on, man. You need me to twist your arm? Yeah, Sit. man, I've been gone for like four out of five weeks. If I go that one through, that'll make all of them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where in, I mean, that's in Vegas. Do you want to give folks time? So if anybody's there close, that they can come uh, by and catch you? Or? Well, we just went through all that. You might ought to check the website. <laughs> uh, Ham Nation, I believe, will be streamed live around uh, 3.30 or 4 on Tuesday the 17th. And the um, the ham reception, I'm not sure of the time on that. I think it's 6 to 8 on that Wednesday night, which will be the 18th. Okay, so 3.30 or 4 Central Time? Uh, th these Central? are all Pacific Times. Pacific, okay. Yeah. Okay. And Tommy and I will also be in Dayton next month. Yeah, looking oh, forward to that. Yeah. yeah. And, I'm already uh, working on my shopping list. You heard, you heard a small part of it a few minutes ago. Yeah. And uh, we'll... We'll be there and uh, trying to meet some of you and trying to get a little good video, too. Uh, Ham Nation's going to have a booth there, and uh, Tommy and I will be hanging around it quite a bit. So come by and say hello to us. It w would be uh, more than thrilled to meet you and, and see who's actually watching this show. You know, it's always good to get input from people through these emails, but it's even better, you know, when we can meet you in person. Yeah, there's got to be a real person on the other side of that thing somewhere. Yeah. The other side of the emails. <laughs> about to be all right um one other thing we'd like to mention jim when can they expect a new episode of amateur logic every month on the 15th of every month going forward okay yeah we made it this time we made it last time we'll make it the next time so all right well, we've really enjoyed it today everybody i know it's been a uh, full show and I hope we were able to squeeze everything into it. Jury's still out on that, but, but hopefully we did. And if we didn't, I guarantee you it'll be in the next one. Come join us on the Facebook group if you're not already a member, and follow us on Twitter at Amateur Logic. Great to see you. 7 3, y'all. We'll catch you next time. Peter. See you next time. See you later. What? <laughs>